Well, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get going here. So um, this is us. This is uh, your speakers and team here today. I guess I'll introduce myself real quick. So hi, I'm Edward. I am a conservation stewardship coordinator at Shedd Aquarium. I dropped the stewardship part because it didn't fit on the slide, but you get the idea. Um, and then uh, I also have here with me uh, Maggie. Hello, thank you, Edward. Hi, everyone. My name is Maggie. I am also a conservation stewardship coordinator for Shed Aquarium. Uh, I apologize in advance that my video is being a little funky today. So if I look a little scary on your screen, at least you can see what I look like in color on, on this slide here. But I'm happy to be here today and present to you all, even if uh, tech functions are a little funny. But maybe something will, will happen during this and I'll it'll be like Dorothy and Wizard of Oz and I'll appear in color at the end of it. I don't know what's happening. But hello, happy to be here. And Phil. And in full color is me, Phil. I'm the director of research with uh, Urban Rivers. Um, we are the group that has been building the Wild Mile for last uh, couple of years or so um, after the development of the Wild Mile framework with a lot of our partners in the city. Um, and we have been wonderfully uh, blessed with the presence of Shed Aquarium's programming in our canal. Um, and so we're really excited to tell you guys all more about what we got going on and uh, our successes. All right, so yeah, this is um, <clears throat> our big vision for uh, what Chicago's river system could be a little bit more like. Um, our project, uh, this flagship project, you can call it the Wild Mile in Chicago. We want to take the canal that makes Goose Island an island. We want to turn it into a mile-long uh, eco park, um, something that brings people to the river, gets them to realize a little bit more uh, the things that their river could be if they just tried a little harder and pushed a little harder. And so um, our vision is really just to create this kind of park, a unique ecological resource in a very central part of the city where people don't really get to experience a lot of wild things all the time. Um, this is something that is easily accessible um, and is really pretty important to, we think, the health of the river. These this river system in particular, um, the Chicago River, we all know has been very heavily impacted over the years. Um, and it's something where we just kind of kept making things a little bit better for industry and kept chunking away at the wildlife piece by piece until there was pretty much nothing left. Here's a very um, old photo of a straightening of the South Branch. So we're looking from the South towards downtown um, this is the south branch. You can kind of recognize the bottom right-hand corner of the picture is going to be the north part of Ping Tom Park. So this is right around Ch Chinatown. They take this normal bend in the river, which a lot of typical rivers will have. It creates different currents and different water movement and allows things to stack. It, allow it creates a lot of habitat when a river is able to wiggle along like that. But we couldn't have that because of all of our ships and all the industrial needs that we had along this river. So we decided we're just gonna cut this straight down, cut a path straight through and forget about the natural part of the river and make a new part of the river that works better for industry. Um, industry, as you can tell, roaring, especially back in the day when uh, rivers and the connection to the Mississippi and the connection to the Great Lakes made Chicago an industrial powerhouse in many, many ways. Um, logistics is very important to kind of everything Chicago was about. So obviously, the more you need industry, the more you treat this like a highway, the less <laughs> there is a chance for wildlife to coexist within our city. And you can see here, um, this is at Rush Street, I believe. So this is kind of downtown. And this, this river was just absolutely loaded with uh, barges, ships, all kinds of things being moved up and down this river. All of our swinging bridges, all of our movable bridges are all oriented towards uh, facilitating this traffic. And of course, nowadays, we just don't really see that. Back after the move of General Iron from our just north of our location, um, that is going to mean that we only really have two barges, barge operators that are moving along the North Branch pretty much at all. Um, so, 
this is something where we just have a really good opportunity in many different spots in the river. This isn't just something we hope to apply to the north side, but the south side as well, Calumet River even. There are plenty of opportunities we have to kind of rewild these places, you know, rewild, such a funny term, but um, there's a lot of things that we can be doing better with the river. The river still faces huge problems, and even though for many years, we've been working to kind of, the city has put in enormous resources, the federal government has put in enormous resources to help revitalize this river, to bring it back to a state where it can become something better, but still has all, all, all these kind of modern issues that come along with um, things that they can't exactly control. Um, we have the big underground reservoirs that can store millions of gallons of rainwater to help prevent our water treatment uh, facilities from being overwhelmed, but even still with an inch of rain, there's something an inch of rain comes down quickly enough and these facilities can become overwhelmed, sewage is discharged, things like this. We had just this last year, three and a half inches of rain within I think a 48 hour period or seven inches in a 48 hour period. And we had floods all over the city. So despite all of our efforts to kind of try to control this environment, we're still finding that no matter what, you know, wildlife, nature is kind of going to do its thing. And all we really have to do is give a little more space for that to happen, especially in urban environments. Um, this brings us to kind of our solution to a lot of the problems that we see around, especially our canal and our stretch of the river. Um, you see here Josh Yellen, one of our co-founders and his fun little uh, pet floating wetland that got there. Um, he's got a hilariously small hat, all these very funny things about this picture. But this is kind of the very beginning. This is the genesis. This is when I started working with Josh. He was doing his master's project at the University of Illinois on this tiny little island. You'll kind of notice a couple things right away. Number one, there's no protection at all against geese. So you can imagine how well that went. We had to replant a couple of times. Two, very low in the water. That did not help keep plants in soil or anything else on. Um, and then three, it's just so tiny that uh, you kind of wonder what could this have possibly done. But over time, this kind of process has evolved. That small little tiny island that he did a very small master's project on helped us go build the next first step of the wild mile, which is turning this kind of small stretch of seawall beneath the Whole Foods on this canal um, into something much more lively, much more full of ecological potential and able to participate in the ecosystem in a way that, you know, a seawall just does not allow. A lot of the river system throughout the course of the river is very typical, you know, some kind of hard seawall edge, metallic edge. Um, the bottom is very either silty or just hard clay or maybe even concrete in some places. So there's a lot of potential uh, ecosystem function that's just wasted because we don't really think too much about these spare spaces. And this is kind of what we're trying to do um, as we go through and build out this uh, wild mile. So here is our first section. So an aerial view looking down of that same set of wetlands. This is our first installation in 2017. These are new plants. They're planted in rows. It's all ni nice and neat. The next picture we have is going to be a year later um, to the day. And you can kind of see the incredible difference that just a year has made. Um, these plants are growing in um, you know, not crazy nutrified, but somewhat, you know, urban waters. So these plants definitely have enough that they need enough nutrition that they need to grow. You just kind of have to give them that stable platform upon which they can grow. And, you know, nature kind of does its thing. You just need to give it a little bit more space, a little bit more time, and nature does its thing. And this also is a great opportunity for us to involve people because another big component, you know, this area is never going to be a forest preserve, it's never going to be pristine, it's never going to be this or that, but what it certainly can be is kind of a living laboratory for a lot of people to be able to experience a natural resource in their backyards. And so we like to um, get it, community members involved. We have a lot of, we have a river ranger program, which these guys will talk a little bit more about how we segue into that and how the shed kind of participates in that. But we have our volunteer program, the river ranger program. 
Um, this last year, we probably had, I think, 200 rangers going out for us over the course of the year. Sometimes it's just as simple as helping us build islands, as you see in the top right. Bottom right, there are times where we just have them kayak around and pick up trash or make observations. On the left there, you see uh, pouring us pouring LECA into this new type of island. So the typical island are rows um, that you pull apart, plants are put in, they pinch at the roots and they grow down. This is a different system of islands where we're filling a very, they, there's kind of a netting, there's kind of a bowl, and then we fill up the bowl with uh, clay pebbles, essentially. And so it's a little bit different substrate for plants to grow on. We hope we can get some more diversity. But our volunteers just spent an entire day helping us spread all that around, which, believe me, was a dump truck full that we put down this stupid little conveyor belt and just bucketed around. It was frustrating, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that these people sign up for. They love this, and especially in this kind of wacky, crazy year, this has been actually pretty important for people um, to get out and do. These pictures, for whatever reason, look terrible on my screen, so I hope they're not that bad to any of you guys. Uh, but this is kind of some of the things that we just have the volunteers do. The top left, you'll see we just had some volunteers. We have a GoPro on a stick. We just tell them, go out, stick it down, and see if you see stuff. Um, on the right, we have a couple of our microscope pictures of our macroinvertebrate sampling. So Hester Dendies, we drop them along the canal here and there. Um, and the MWRD has gathered a lot for us, and we're taking pictures of them. Our volunteers are kind of categorizing those populations of these little bugs that live in the river and are important sources of food. On um, bottom left comes to the Urban Stream Lab. We had our volunteers help us search for a gravid female mussel, a pregnant mussel, so we can bring it to the Urban Re uh, Stream Research Center in DuPage County and have them help us rear them. Um, so that we could put them in artificial habitats back in the wild mile later. Um, so these are kind of all the cool things that our rangers get to do over the year. Um, and it's kind of become this really cool but important and also very helpful thing for us because these are eyes and ears of nature enthusiasts who just want to kind of get outside and have a good time and look at birds and stuff. And that is very helpful for informing us and all the good things that we do. Um, one of the big tasks they had over the year was trash pickup. This is our trash log from this past year. They logged about 10,000 individual pieces of trash, broke them down into categories. And anybody who's interested in this, we can send along the link later. Um, but essentially, um, of these pieces, the biggest thing that they were finding was, uh, if not styrofoam fragments, then food wrappers, packaging, other plastic fabric, bottle caps, um, aluminum cans, and then grocery bags. Um, these are the kind of things that we need to know because it's really helpful for us to be able to tell where this trash is coming from and um, what's kind of going on. All these different things are useful in informing us of what we're doing well and what areas we need to do better in. So this is not only something that we're involving the community in just because it's fun for them, but it's also educational. It also really helps us accomplish our mission of rewilding this canal to the best degree it can be. All right, thanks, Phil. Um, so as you can see, this is a pretty uh, wild and fantastic project these guys have been working on for several years now. So naturally, when the opportunity came up for us, at our conservation team at the aquarium to partner, uh, it was a very natural, easy partnership to make. Um, one of the things that was a big priority for us going into this partnership was not only supporting with the you know, installation of these floating, floating gardens and islands to continue to build this project, but also continue to build out the community aspect of this and try to audience beyond not just the wild mile communities around it, but throughout Chicago. And one of the ways that we came up with to accomplish that was this new program, Kayak for Conservation. Um, pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's an IAC water-based program uh, designed to take participants out and do various forms of conservation activities in and around the Wild Mile. So you can see here a couple images uh, that kind of are very representative of the experience out there. So we have, uh, especially on the top left there, uh, some volunteers who are looking at fish that we pulled from some fish traps we have out there to monitor the fish presence, both underneath and around the islands and also in areas where islands aren't installed. Uh, some folks in kayaks uh, just with clipboards taking notes of what pollinators are they seeing? Are they seeing butterflies, bees, or uh, dragonflies and damselflies out there? Uh, and then, yeah, 
you know, one of the biggest issues we still face out there in information we're looking for is just trash. So we'll hand our participants uh, rubber gloves, uh, pool skimmers, and uh, grabbers in order to pull all that stuff out of the water and continue to categorize it. So at first, the program was kind of just making it up as we go, admittedly. We started in 2018 with a concept of what we wanted to do, but weren't totally sure about sort of what aspects were most important, uh, what the monitoring was going to look like, or even what our participants were going to want to do. Uh, you know, are these folks, are they going to want to have a more sort of history focus? Are they going to do uh, different types of monitoring? Are they even going to want to touch that? frankly gross nasty trash in the river we really weren't sure what to expect but the first year proved to be really successful we just made it a free program because we were testing things out and it sold out quote unquote filled up uh within a couple of weeks of us putting out the initial announcement out so clearly there was an appetite for this kind of program uh to get in a kayak and experience the chicago river in a meaningful way uh we did a handful of programs that season and then come 2019 we learned a lot uh, in terms of what people are willing actually to do. So we added a lot more historical emphasis to the programming. Uh, we improved the monitoring efforts so that they were a little bit easier for folks to understand and figure out. Um, but one of the most interesting things was that in 2019, uh, we also incorporated a uh, payment model. We started charging for the program, mostly just to offset cuts costs for uh, renting the kayaks that the participants were using uh, for the experience. And one of the things that we found was that the cost associated with the programs was maybe set a little too high for the different groups and audiences that we were looking for. But again, it was a bit of an experiment. And at this point, we had also parsed out the program to two different tiers. First was the Explorers program, which was more sort of the introductory. And then there was the Monitors program, which was designed for folks that wanted something slightly more in depth. Going into 2020, we got a lot of survey results. So whether that was in terms of costs, whether that was in terms of experience type, uh, you know, and there was a lot of feedback too that maybe some we control, some we couldn't. A lot of people had complaints about porta potties. Eh, you know, what are we going to do about that? Uh, but there were other ones, for, for example, they felt like the historical elements weren't uh, thorough enough. Or in many cases, one of the things that surprised us was that people wanted more of the trash collection. People were actually really into it. It was almost like a water scavenger hunt and wanted to do more because it was a very meaningful action that you could take right now that by the, between the start and the end of your kayak session, you could already see a very big difference between what it looked like. Um, and then additionally was just also breaking down the barrier to the fact that a lot of the people that were coming to this program were people who had never been on the water before. Kayak, canoe, period. Uh, and so what we encountered was that, you know, when they saw, you know, Shed Aquarium, this name that anybody in Chicago will recognize, it seemed like a trustworthy name and one they wanted to go out on the water with. Oh, if they're going out and kayak on the river, well, then I guess it must be safe. I'm not, my hand's not going to melt when I touch the water. I, you know, I'm probably not going to fall out of my boat and get eaten by chance the snapper. Um, and so what we saw was that. A lot of the time, it was just good enough to be able to get people out on the water and talk to them about the river. This is what it looks like. This is its past. This is what we've done to it before. This is what it looks like today. And this is where we think it's going based on the work that's being done by us and Urban Rivers and numerous other players in the river system. So in 2020, we introduced the third tier program, which was our most introductory. It was simply a tour. There was no monitoring involved, and it was just an opportunity for people to learn how to kayak, get out on the water with us, even if they'd never paddled in their lives, uh, and learn about the river system. And it turned out that was our, by far our most successful program. I want to turn it over to Maggie now to talk a little bit more about those different program types. Yes, thank you, Edward. So yeah, like uh, most other people, we had a bit of a strange year going into our summer of 2020, um, thanks to our friend COVID. Um, but thankfully, we were able to, you know, improvise, adapt and overcome. And fortunately, we were working in an outdoor program, which gave us some leniency to get out there still and run this program safely and effectively and have our best year yet. Incredibly, even those numbers Edward just shared, I'm still surprised every time I look at them that we had over a 1000 people out in a year where we didn't even know if we were going to get to be out there when you know Chicago beaches were closed and so many other things were shut down we were very lucky that we were able to get out there and do this and what better activity to be out social distancing than an outdoor kayak experience it really was great that we were uh, able to be out there as we can see from this sign that our partners at kayak Chicago put up um, it's really fortunate that a good paddle is about six feet length away so it was always easy if you're too close if you're touching paddles with someone else you're too close and you got to move away from them 
come and keep your masks up. Um, so it was really great that we were able to add in even more programs that we wanted than we had originally planned on at the beginning of the summer. Um, we were, at, as Edward said, we were able to adapt a entirely new program based on survey results from previous years and just get people out there, uh, like Edward said, learning about the river, appreciating it and developing an affection for this area that we want to see grow a lot in the next uh, coming years. Um, so just kind of a high overview of those three programs that we do. The introductory one we do is the, our river discovery program. It's our shortest experience and it's an hour and a half long and it's for our folks who maybe have no paddling experience whatsoever. They've never been out on the Chicago River. They don't even know what the Chicago River is. Um, you can come out, you learn about the program. It's a, simply a tour. You get to come out and listen to Edward and I and some of our colleagues talk at you for an hour and a half and hopefully learn something fun along the way about the Chicago River itself, its ecological history, and also about what Phil and the folks over at Urban Rivers are doing. Um, we take you along, we take you down those steel walls you see and look at the, uh, the floating wetlands, learn about them, chat about it, and then head back. Um, the next one is our River Explorers, which is a little Still, for folks who maybe don't have any previous uh, kayaking experience, it's still beginner friendly. Um, but on this one, we get into a little bit more about uh, the challenges the river faces, and we do some uh, monitoring along the trash, like Phil mentioned, uh, that we are collecting data on what kind of trash is out there, and we are sending that over to our partners at Loyola University, who are, uh, the fun thing is we get to collect the data, but we don't have to do any of the nitty gritty analyzing of the data. Um, thank you to Loyola, the fine folks over there, we send it over there, and then they can look at it. They can see what are the most common things out there, what are they made out of, where are they coming from, and then hopefully once we know what is out there, we can figure out where it's coming from. And then from that, um, we can figure out how to stop it, hopefully. Um, so that was uh, an aspect of our River Explorers um, program. Uh, and that is a, a program we've been running for three years. And again, as Edward said, some survey results kind of changed the way we do that, uh, the way our experiences of running that and the way uh, uh, participants experience that we changed. Um, kind of the process for doing that trash monitoring and made it more of a root uh, data collection uh, process where it has more of a scientific basis to it where we're doing the same thing in the same spot every time for the same amount of time so that we know that uh, what we're doing isn't just maybe just affected by the location or how far people are paddling because we're um, <clears throat> doing that collection in the same area every time. The next one, our highest level of uh, programming is the River Monitors. Um, it's our longest program and uh, we say it's maybe not for beginners, so I think a beginner could still come out and have a good time um, just because it's three hours long and we're doing a little bit more tipsy turving monitoring kind of stuff. Um, we do the trash monitoring again and as well as we're going down the canal, we're looking at what kind of waterfall is out there so that over the years of the program as the wild mile grows, are we seeing a change in the population of waterfall out there? Are we seeing an increase in numbers. Um, the other monitorings we do is we do turtle monitoring. Again, same reason. Are we seeing a change in where they're hanging out? Are they coming over to other art parts of the river that they weren't in before because of these new uh, wetland installations? Uh, I can say just kind of anecdotally, definitely the birds have been appreciating the wetland installations. As soon as we put in a new wetland installation this summer, the very next day we saw uh, juvenile black crowned night herons hanging out on them, appreciating where we put them. So that's always a good sign to see that the animals are appreciating it. Uh, the other thing we do on that one is our fish monitoring. So we work with uh, a researcher at Shed who wants to understand how what kind of fish are out there using the channel. So we have these uh, fish traps hanging out under the islands, uh, uh, under some docks in the area and along the kind of more naturally kind of bank. And we're trying to figure out what kind of fish species are there. Are they using the island space more than they're using other areas? And then as we continue to build out this project, we can use that data as we move forward to make sure we're keeping what's in the best interest of the wildlife in mind as we move forward and make sure that we are having a positive impact on them. Um, yeah, Edward, do you want to break down any of those numbers for us or no? Um, I mean, yeah, I think a lot of them speak for themselves. You can see kind of the progression over the years. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing too is that I think even as maybe some of the species numbers don't necessarily move as much in the short term here, even just the sheer abundance though of what we're seeing out there is changing. Um, you know, and I guess some of that can be reflected by the frequency, certainly the increase in number of participants we're bringing out. Uh, but yeah, to echo Maggie's point, you know, every time we put in a new installation, we definitely are seeing an uptick in uh, the sheer number of 
wildlife that we're seeing out in that space. Um, you know, it's kind of early on to be able to look at some of the numbers we've collected and be able to really determine any clear trends just yet. Uh, but I mean, that's the hope, right? We've started, we started this in 2018 and maybe a few more years down the line, we'll really start to see some very clear correlations with our continued restoration works out there. Um, yeah. So you've heard about us and our kind of assessment of things, but what did the kayakers themselves say? So every year we did, we did a more or less same survey for each of our participants after they come out, just asking them, give us your feedback, your honest feedback. Uh, you know, especially early, early on in the stage like this, three years in, we're still pretty new at it. We're still learning and trying to make it a better program. So I won't give you the full breakdown of all the survey data. It was pretty extensive. Uh, but the most interesting thing was that basically the overall experience was pretty consistent. Across those three years, people loved it. And even when we thought it couldn't get any better, the if feedback does continue to get better. And while that's certainly a testament to uh, Maggie and I and the other Shed and Urban Rivers folks, yes, we are awesome. Um, I think that's more a testament to the experience in general. Uh, you know, the amount of feedback back that we've gotten, it really tells us that you know, people were just very excited to be present in the river, to learn something they'd never learned before, to experience this in such a different way, which I think is much more a testament to the fact that this is the type of programming that people really want to see and really want to participate in. Um, it helps as well that in 2020, along with all of the COVID considerations and everybody being just hungry to get outside, we also switched to a pay what you can model uh, to allow and accommodate for folks that maybe uh, can't afford to pay more and wanted to join us and folks that maybe couldn't pay as much but still wanted to come out and experience this. We wanted to try to reduce the barriers as much as possible for uh, folks to be able to join us on the river. And indeed, the experience itself seems to have also improved. And I think that is a large part to do with us adding uh, new programs and different considerations like the River Discovery Program in 2020 uh, to reflect what we're hearing from these surveys. So, you know, you probably hear a lot that surveys matter, but they only matter as much as you actually are able to take the information and actually you know, adjust and make that make those differences. And thankfully for us, we have the ability in this case to uh, adjust and kind of work with what we have. We have a pretty wide leash in terms of what we're able to do out in the space. So we can really incorporate people's feedback and try to make it the program that not just what we want to accomplish, but what they want from it. Back to you, Meg. Yeah, so we can look at, you know, the data, the data all the time and um, again, let everyone shower us with compliments and tell us how awesome we are. Uh, I'll be honest, we kind of need it. We're desperate for approval, or at least I am. <laughs> but really what success looks like is uh, what we're growing from this. So the whole goal of the program really in this partnership is to keep this project going, to keep this Wild Mile project going. And what we saw from Phil is we can't do that without the volunteers. You can't put in these islands without the help of hundreds, two hundreds of people coming out to give their time and do that. But we don't have that community of people without people who care about the river. Um, so the goal of our program really going from in river discovery down to monitors is to introduce people to the river, get them out there uh, thinking that, you know, this is actually a really cool amenity here in Chicago. Um, we always start out our program. The first question we always ask people is, what do you think of the Chicago River? And you might not be surprised by some of the answers that we hear. We almost always hear, you know, dirty, smelly, St. Patrick's Day, uh, every so often, yeah, we get green, whether that's for St. Patrick's Day or because of the filth, who knows? That That's the perception people have of the river. And we're out there trying to change that perception. So through these our three tiers of this program, we're trying to get people out there and appreciating this as a resource for them and for wildlife and uh, trying to better understand what they can do to help that along the way. So ideally what we wanna do is feed people from our program into that river ranger program so that we can keep them engaged with the river, keep them uh, wanting to save it and see it going uh, in the right direction moving forward. Um, again, this project isn't going anywhere without the help of other people. So it, we really do need those volunteers along the way and this is what success looks like, is bringing those people out and keeping them engaged along the way. So this is uh, Luis. I hope she, I don't know, if, I would hope that she's watching, but I don't know if she is. But if you are, Luis, hello. Um, but Luis has been coming out with us for Kayak for Conservation since 2019. Um, she is from the UK, so she did not grow up with the Chicago River, but she grew up or she came here and saw the river and was kind of curious about it and saw our program. And she 
loved it. She came out very often with us. Uh, every time she comes out, she says she learned something new and has since become a huge steward for the river. She is now a river ranger as well. She's an official river ranger. She's out there every week picking up trash. And it, that would, may, might not have happened if she never came out and learned about the river with us. Um, so this is the kind of thing we need is we need those people to come out and learn about it and then keep caring for it. Um, Edward, can you go to the next one? And then these are some more of our lovely uh, participants turned river rangers. We've got Kathy, Amy, and Jill here who have come out. They came out first with us just for a little group, a little girls kayak paddle um, to do something fun with themselves, with each other. And they ended up loving it. And they too have filtered through. I think they've all done each one of our programs and are now river rangers. So they're all also out there every week volunteering their time and dedicated to conserving this system and to keep it clean, keep it going and keep the Wild Mile project going. And there's so many other participants from our program that have gone on to uh, become river rangers. I don't know what the percentage is or what the exact number is. And I wish I had photos of everyone, but it's uh, hard to get photos of every single person on every single kayak. Um, but we have a really great group of re this really great base of volunteer, these participants turned volunteers who are out there stewarding the river. And again, our goal is that they come out with us, they learn about the river, and then maybe they become a river ranger, and then they take it maybe even a step further where they're advocating for the river in every aspect. So uh, backing, uh, voting to back policy or calling their alderman or senator to get some policy moving around this to keep stuff like this going. Um, so we can keep seeing the Wild Mile Project going just here, but also see other improvements of the Chicago River throughout the whole system. So we're reaching the end of our time in our presentation here, uh, but real quick, we're going to kind of close off with sort of our biggest sort of individual takeaways here. Um, and since I'm talking, I'll go ahead with mine, which is that you, when we've set out to make this program, there wasn't really a lot of models out there for what we were trying to do. We certainly were able to draw from other, some of the work that other organizations had done in terms of water-based programming, uh, but there was nothing that we were able to find that really kind of gave us a clear framework for this. Uh, so as we were out there kind of just figuring out what would stick uh, and trial and erroring and getting survey results and figuring it out from there, one of the things that I think that really kind of stood out is that if you have done any kind of programming at all, you know that there are really a lot of really basic factors, you know, on land programming that you consider. Um, and all of those considerations are just as applicable to the water. It may not seem like it. It might seem like it's an entirely different world and environment and like, oh man, for the playbook out. But a lot of fundamentals, especially for example, if you've, uh, you know, have I, I'm NI uh, certified, I'm a certified interpretive guide. And all of those tools that we learn in that program are very much applicable here. Making sure that, you know, you're making everybody feel comfortable and safe in that environment. Making sure that everybody's basic needs are met in terms of just knowing where the bathrooms are, you know, the uh, escape hatches, or making sure that everybody just knows that their life jacket's on safe. And never just assuming that people do or don't know certain things about the river uh, or the environment that you're working with. At some point, the biggest content that everybody has come to this, no matter what tier of program you're in, has been the information. They really just love to learn. Uh, and we found that pretty much anybody who comes out, age, background, gender, it's pretty universal. People are excited to learn about the, their local environment. And that's definitely very much at play with this program. Maggie or Phil. Yeah, that was that was beautiful, Edward. I was like super engaged listening to you. I'm like, what's, <laughs> what's Thank the you. biggest That's takeaway? <laughs> yeah, yeah, similar. Yeah, my biggest takeaway for sure, uh, Phil. Of course, your islands are cool. There, the Wild Mile is awesome. But really, my biggest thing is the people's engagement with it, and how, like Edward said, how easy it is to engage people with this. Because um, really, uh, like I said, a lot of people think of this river like it's stinky and it's industrial. So many people come out. This this photo right here, where you're sitting in those kayaks right there, you don't even feel like you're on the Chicago River system. You're you're immersed in nature, but you can't see it off camera. There it is a beautiful view of like the, all the skyscrapers of downtown Chicago. So you feel like you're really emerged in a natural space, but also very clearly right in the heart of the city. And it's such a cool resource that not so not enough people, I feel like, appreciate and utilize. And this program, again, is really great at introducing people to that. Like, oh, kayaking on the river is not scary. It's not gross. Maybe I can do this elsewhere, uh, closer to my home along the river. If you live in the city of Chicago, you live 
pretty close to the river. The river runs all throughout our city in many different directions. Uh, you don't got to go far to get to the river wherever you are. And it can be something that people can utilize and, and use and can appreciate. I still, when I tell my mom and my grandparents that I'm out kayaking on the river every day for work, they think that they're like, who would kayak out on the river? And it's like, I do every day and I love it. And it's awesome. Like Edward yeah. said, when I splash my arm in the river, I get water in my eye. I'm not scared I'm going to grow a third eye or a third arm. It's all nice and clean. Um, and really just sharing that knowledge with people and uh, helping them grow and understand it. Uh, and also just another thing is bringing people out kayaking for the first time is just such a great experience. You'll get those people who are jittery getting into their kayak and they're super nervous. And by the end of it, they're a pro kayaker. They're like kayaking circles around other participants. And it's just so great to see people find that love and find something new that they can do again, like right in their own backyard. It's just really awesome. Yeah, no, and I I just say that it's it's been kind of um, really heartening to see that even with everything going on, people's lives have been upended over the past year. You know, we've had people that have come out and say that, um, you know, I lost my job in the spring. I had to move back home with my parents. You know, one person had their research um, trip to Africa canceled. Like all these things, these crazy things that have happened to people over the year. And they came here and they just did something as simple and dirty as pick up trash from a kayak. But they tell us that this was something that fulfilled them and sustained them over the year. And I think it's just becoming more and more important um, and apparent that what really connects people is this kind of shared experience and a resource like this. And I think it's just better for our health in general as a city if we stop treating parks like just kind of a pretty little amenity uh, that you occasionally take your dog to go poop at. You know, it's kind of got to be more about um, connecting people with their environment and with nature. And I think this is just a really cool way for everyone to be able to do that in a really meaningful way for them. So yeah, uh, I think we'll go into questions now, but if you want either any of our contact info, please, please, please feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, we're always happy to talk about uh, the, the Wild Mob Project and the Kayak Conservation Program. If you have any thoughts or input or questions, please let us know. We would love to talk with you guys. Uh, that's our info right there. In addition to your info, do you have a, a link to share about the program or anything like that? Um, or is it just to reach out to to your email addresses? That is a great point. Um, yeah, I believe the URL is shedaquarium.org slash kayak. Pretty straightforward. That'll take you to our program page. I'll be upfront and say it's not a very detailed page. Um, it's uh, uh, it, but it has the basic information there. And again, if you have any further follow-up questions about anything that's on there, please just shoot us an email. Um, but yeah, and uh, Phil, I, I forget exactly what you guys' URL is. Yeah, we're we're just urbanriv.org because some guy in Montana owns Urban Rivers. So. <laughs> Um, there were some great questions that came in, you know, throughout throughout the session. I sort of grouped a few of them for you. Um, for one was, how deep is the water along the Wild Mile? It is shallow. It is. Um, we've kind of run around there with some sonar, some depth finding equipment, and it gets um, as shallow as one to two feet on some of the sides. Um, I'd say probably like a rough average. The deepest points can be maybe eight feet and like probably the average or so is like four to five feet. Um, but a lot of that bottom is just fine sediments. So there's probably already, there's probably another two to three feet of just like really loose muck before you kind of hit a clay bottom. Um, so it's sort of a weird situation, but just over the years, it's been kind of silting up a little bit more. Um, so you're not really gonna be able to get much boat traffic down there that's larger than a pontoon boat really. A similar question, is there a maximum imposed that limits how far the floating islands can stick out into the river? Yeah, um, we have, it's be, just because no one's done this before, it's kind of, it's been confusing to weave through all the, um, essentially the first thing that we were told was like 20 feet off of where the maps were originally drawn, which was 1900. So this part of the river was much more narrow then. So like, at first they were telling us it was not gonna be able to come out very far. 
Um, then we had some kind of other Army Corps processes that we went through. So it's a 408 review, which is just like a pretty standard view that allows us to take much more of the canal. Um, theoretically, it can get up to the point where um, if you deauthorize this canal as a navigable body of water, as a navigable waterway, you could take up basically 50% of the canal on either side. So essentially all you'd really have to do is be able to get a rescue boat or something up and down if somewhere to fall in or whatever. You just need to have space to be able to do that. So theoretically, you can take over a lot more of the canal depending on how many permits and processes we go through. But as of now, it's kind of like, you know, maybe limited at like 20 or 30 feet coming off the seawall, which is still a good amount of surface area for plants. You know, you've seen what that looks like thus far. I think we should, we, I don't think we've mentioned this so far, but that channel that we're working in with the Wild Mile, it's not a very heavily used channel. So it's that uh, eastern north side of Goose Island and it's that more natural curvy side on the west side of Goose Island that's more heavily used. The bridges that go along that canal don't move. So no large boats are really going through there. It's mostly kayakers, canoers, and like small party pontoons and electric boats. Um, so that definitely uh, gives hope that it, it, with it not being su super commercially used or uh, tourism used that perhaps there will be a chance that we'll be able to extend that more. Yeah, and that makes it a very ideal microcosm for this kind of programming, especially since we target a lot of people who have never paddled before. They really don't have to deal with that sort of extra layer of navigating other larger boats or motors or wakes coming through. Um, and then, yeah, just the flow of the river itself is extraordinarily slow, so nobody's like paddling against the current. It's a very ideal place for people to kind of get their bearings and learn how to kayak. Excellent. I'm going to group a couple of other questions as we're, we're running short of time um, to sort of reaction. So there was a question about how long did it take for the city to agree to your efforts? And then sort of as a part two, what has the support been like um, from businesses along along that stretch of the canal and the river? Yeah, the, the city has been um, very receptive to it pretty much from the beginning. Um, it has always been something where it's like everyone's kind of encouraging us to do it, but the ability to do it, the things that you have to go through, it's like this is why the bureaucracy is why nobody's done it to this point. It's just a really difficult thing to have started. But now that we've kind of broken through that, it's really just a matter of fundraising. It's really just a matter of getting the money to put these things in um, in a kind of uh, strategic way. Um, and so the city, the city's been great, and they've we've tapped into their OSIF funds. So every com or residential development has a tax on it um, that goes into park space in a certain area. So we've been able to tap into those funds. Um, other local groups, they've all been same thing, receptive, but they often have big corporate structures above them that prevent them from really doing um, as much as they might like. So the first one, we have to get a permit for every single one of these property owners and tenants along the canal to be able to do anything on their seawall. So the first step is just getting permission from them, which started with Whole Foods and then kind of expanded to REI and waste management. Um, as we go further down, we'll have to get uh, permits from uh, Carbet Pain and FedEx and all these other um, places down there. So it's just kind of a really long process. Um, the corporate, everyone who has this in their backyard really wants it. You know, there's really not been any resistance, but the only thing is just it's some of their corporate structures and bureaucracies are really hard to work through. Um, but everyone's pretty much all, why wouldn't you? you know? <laughs> why wouldn't you be on board? 